while the world looks upon me as I struggle your place in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16 this evening, 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, and uh, we are <clears throat> uh, wrapping up our study in 1 Corinthians. This took us about 35 messages to get through these chapters, which I think is actually moving at a pretty good pace, don't you, to make it through in 35, uh, 35 messages. And there's a time when I probably would have spent more time uh, preaching through uh, these chapters, and uh, I just have sort of evolved in the way that I preach through a book of the Bible. And really, I'll be honest with you, I'm more concerned with your understanding what the Word of God says than how many messages I preach through a book. Uh, some people, they, uh, they make it a bragging point of how many messages they can preach in a passage of Scripture, but really, I, I just want you to understand what God's Word says, and that's the goal at the end of the day. And I want you to know uh, how to apply it to your life. And so I've tried to stay focused as we went through this and uh, focus on the main points that the Holy Spirit makes. And uh, here we are. My plan, and I'm not, a, I'm not a guaranteeing this is how it's going to happen, but my plan is to finish the chapter tonight to walk through the entire 16th chapter. And then I want to go back uh, next Wednesday night. won't do it on Sunday night because we have our youth meeting, youth service. And so next Wednesday, my plan is to try to do a summary of the entire book before we move on to 2 Corinthians. We're just going right on through and to 2 Corinthians. And so I uh, don't see any reason to stop, but uh, we will do a, uh, try to do a summary, just try to go back over some of the things that we've covered. I'm not going to promise that, but that's my plan. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but this evening, we'll, <clears throat> we're going to get right into the text here. And uh, we'll, we'll walk through these verses together. not going to read anything to begin with. I'm just going to have a word of prayer. And then we'll walk through these verses together tonight. Father, we do love you. We thank you for all of your many blessings on us. We're so undeserved, uh, Lord, of, of anything that we have. 
Uh, we just want to thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here on a Wednesday night and to open the Word of God again. And we just pray that you would bless it now as we look through these passages of Scripture. Pray that you'd give us what we need to get, and we'll give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Maybe you've been in a, uh, through a, 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 on a hike or a deep hike in the woods. I'm not much of a hiker. Uh, I'm not against it. I just don't do a whole lot of it. I've done some hiking while I was deer hunting, kind of hiking by default, trying to get to somewhere that I was going. And don't do that much anymore either. I like to kind of park and just not go very far. I've turned into a lazy hunter. And so I don't really want to walk very far. I like to hunt kind of close to the truck in case I happen to kill anything. I don't want to have to drag it too far. Uh, but we, we, we went camping a few weeks ago, and uh, y'all, some of y'all know about that, and I convinced Keela after all these years uh, to do something outdoors, and, and uh, so we went camping. We had a great time. It, we enjoyed ourselves, and we, we, uh, we ended up going on a, a hike by uh, accident, and uh, my dad, he was with us, and uh, we were camping there, and he wanted to go see this specific uh, place, this mention going to see this historic site, and in his mind... I guess it had been several years since he had been there, and he thought it was just right off of the road. And so uh, it sounded like a good idea, and so we all loaded up in the van, and we drove up to where this, this place was, and uh, then we figured out there's a trail there, and you have to walk down the trail, and, and uh, still, though, thinking that it wasn't far off in the woods. And so uh, if it would have been far off in the woods, he probably wouldn't have went at, at this point in his life. But we started down the trail. And so there we go down the trail, and we, we get in there a little bit. And I, I realized pretty quickly as we got into the woods that we weren't going to arrive where he thought we were going to arrive very quickly. I understood that we, were, we, we, <laughs> we had embarked on a journey, on a hike. And, uh, and so that was okay with me. My children were having a good time, but I was a little worried about my dad. He's, he's got some health issues and diabetes and things, and he's out of shape at this stage in his life. And if he's listening, I'm sorry, Dad. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, the further we walked, the more nervous I became. And I thought, man, what, <laughs> what if something happens? We're out here in the woods. And, uh, and it, took, it took a lot longer than we had anticipated. We walked and we walked and we walked and the trail was rocky and there were roots in the trail and slippery places to be aware of. And, and, uh, and then finally, I could tell that the woods were transitioning into an opening and I kind of let out a sigh of relief, you know, uh, because I knew we had made it back to the road and what had uh, supposed to have been a very short, straightforward journey ended up being quite the uh, adventure. And that's kind of like the book, the book of 1 Corinthians. When I read the book of 1 Corinthians, you start out in chapter number one and you think, man, it's going to be, it's going to be a real pleasant journey, going to be a, just kind of a straightforward journey. And then you get into the woods. And we've been in the woods, have we not? We've been into some, some, uh, some jungle places in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we get in there and we find all this jungle of issues and problems that Paul is uh, walking through and dealing with, with, rebu with rebuke and correction and reproof. But as we emerge from that forest tonight, we emerge out of that, that jungle of issues. We come to this 16th chapter, and it's like taking a sigh of relief as we walk out of the woods. And Paul changes his tone from harsh rebuke to uh, peaceful and very practical instruction as he concludes this 16th chapter. And I just want to give you some final instructions from uh, Paul to the Corinthians, just some final instructions for the Corinthian church. It's kind of customary if you read the, the epistles that Paul wrote that he always kind of ends his letter with various instructions. So it's always like Paul is very pointed as he moves through and then he gets to the end. He's like, okay, this is everything else I didn't get to. This is everything that I want to say. And he throws several things out. And that's kind of what happens here in the 16th chapter here of 1 Corinthians. And so uh, we'll just walk down through a few things tonight. Look in verse number one. First of all, Paul instructs them concerning giving. He instructs them concerning giving. And I'm not going to I'm not going to bog down here so nobody get nervous tonight. We're going to get to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and we're going to bog down on giving. And so when we get there we'll really spend some time. So I don't intend to spend much time, but let's read it together now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. 
Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I am come, whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. And so Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints. It's clarified in other passages of Scripture that Paul is talking about the saints in Jerusalem. And it seems because of persecution that the believers in Jerusalem were facing some impoverishment and facing some hard and difficult times. And so Paul is collecting an offering here. And he's collecting it from different churches. He says, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia. And so he's not just getting a collection from the Corinthians, but Paul is collecting an offering from several churches to take to the Jerusalem church. And he had ordered those believers in Galatia to give to this offering. He says to the Corinthians, I'm ordering you to do the same thing, to give to this, this work. Now, it doesn't take a lot of observation to recognize that the Corinthians had a problem with selfishness. Yes. Seemed like every issue we went through as we studied the book of 1 Corinthians, it always came back to the main problem, and that main problem was that they were selfish. They, 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 uh, they had a problem with selfishness, and they had this division going on, and they had their little holy huddles, and rather than loving each other unconditionally, they all were pursuing their own interests, and rather than being a good soldier of Jesus Christ, they were skirmishing with each other. And, and so they had this selfishness, and I've said this to you many times, and I repeat uh, we talked about it when we were going through the book of Philippians. When a church becomes inwardly focused, when it becomes focused on me, when it's about me and when it's about you, when it's about what I want, it's about what you want, then what happens is they lose sight of their mission. They lose sight of what's important, and that's what happened to the Corinthian church. They became selfish, and they lost sight of their mission. And what happens is... They, they, they narrowed their scope of ministry, which leads to everybody forming their own special interest, and then conflict ensues. And churches fuss and fight when they lose sight of their mission. And Paul knows that uh, here's a great antidote for selfishness was to look around at other people's needs. And so Paul says, you need to look around. There's a need in Jerusalem that you can be a part of meeting. And, and when we look at other needs, we gain perspective, don't we? We gain perspective oftentimes of our own pettiness. We gain perspective uh, 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 that we're not the only people on the face of the planet. And we're not the only congregation on the face of the planet. And we realize that the mission is much bigger than us. And the mission is much, much bigger than our ministries. And so one of the answers to the Corinthians' problem was to get their focus off each other and to get their focus back on the world again. Paul says, while you're fussing and feuding, brothers and sisters in Jerusalem are suffering. They're starving while you're fussing about silly stuff. And I'm going to tell you, that's why, the, that's why the Philadelphia Baptist Church has to keep her vision for the world. That's why we need to give $200,000 to missions this year. Amen? That's why we need to keep reaching our community with the gospel. That's why we got to keep sending people to the mission field and training and preparing people to go to the mission field. Because the moment we lose our vision, then we start looking around at each other and the fussing and fighting will start. All the infighting will start and we'll have all the Baptist drama that, that everybody else has. And so, so Paul says the solution to all the fussing and fighting is to get in your pocketbook and to give to missions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That's a great solution. Yeah. I think it was Harold Siler that used to say every time their church got in financial trouble, let's take on another missionary. Yeah. Well, here's what I say. Every time they start fussing and fighting, let's take on another missionary. Yeah. That's the solution. Get your eyes off each other and get your eyes on the world. That's what Paul is saying. 
Let's, let's, let's get our eyes on the world. And so, so he gives them some given principles here. Not going to deal a whole lot with it. Just walk you down through it real quick. We get to 2 Corinthians 8, 9. We'll dig in a little bit deeper. But he says that their giving was to be systematic. On the first day, verse number 2, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. And so their giving was to be done on the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week, anybody? That's Sunday. And so every Sunday when they met together, not Saturday, but they met together on Sunday, every Sunday when they met together, they were to have an offering and they were to, they were, they were to be prepared to give in that offering. It was to be systematic. I'm not going to spend time here, but giving is not, not just slipping your hand in your pocket and pulling out what you've got. That's right. yeah. That's right. It's supposed to be systematic. In other words, you are prepared to give. Now, I know sometimes we just off the fly say, okay, we're going to take an offering up. That's not what I'm talking about. But, but, but you ought to be planned in your giving, systematic. And then their giving was to include everyone from the first day of the week. Let every one of you. And so there's nobody, Paul says, that is exempt from giving. Everybody should give. We're going to get to 2 Corinthians and we're going to study about the Macedonians, how they gave out of their poverty. They were poor and yet they gave. Their giving was to be, watch this, according to God's prospering them. Look in verse number two, as God has prospered him. Paul says you are to give in accordance to how God has blessed you. If every Christian gave in accordance to how God had blessed them, we'd never have to worry about begging for money ever again, would we? Never again. Verse number two, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul didn't want to be able to collect the money when he came to Corinth. He wanted to be able to, 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 he wanted them to be prepared so that when he got there, that he could get the money to the church in Jerusalem without delay. Verse number three, and when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Paul says, whoever you feel is trustworthy, whoever you appoint, we're going to let them carry that money to the church in Jerusalem, verse number four, and if, it, and if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Paul said, if it's necessary, if we feel like it's necessary, I don't know if it was based on what size the gift was, I don't know, but Paul says, if it's necessary for me to go, then I'll go for accountability's sake. And so Paul instructs them in giving. He says, the way to fix your issue is to give, is to get your eyes off of each other and get your eyes on the world that needs the gospel. Secondly, Paul not only deals with their giving, but he instructs them concerning their attitudes towards others in the ministry. He instructs them concerning their attitudes towards others in the ministry. And one of the things you'll find about the writing of the Apostle Paul is that his attitude was always positive towards other people that he worked with. Only a few times he had to speak negatively about somebody that he worked with, and it was because they had left the faith or they had defaulted. But Paul was very positive, and he never viewed other people in the ministry as competitors. But he always viewed them as partners in the ministry. And uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he wants them to have that same attitude. He wants them to not view other people as competitors but to view them as partners as well. Why is that so important in the church in Corinth? Y'all remember how it all started out? Remember what we talked about right off the bat? They've got these factions in the church, and there's one group of Apollos, and there's one group of Peter, and there's one group of Paul, and one group, super spiritual group, that they only follow Jesus, and they don't follow a man. It's that group. And, 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 and so at, at the end of the letter, uh, uh, Paul is, he wants their attitude to be right towards other people in the ministry. He don't want them to look at it as competition. That was never Paul's attitude. He always encouraged the churches in which he had an influence to respect and honor all of those that were in the gospel ministry. Paul was never the I'm the only one doing it right guy. He never was. He always said, this guy deserves your respect. And this guy's doing a good job. And this guy ought to be honored. And this guy ought to be respected. And, and, and he was never just promote me kind of guy. Paul was always, the world is going to hell. We need to get the gospel to them. Let's not build our own little kingdoms, but let's all build together God's kingdom. Amen? And he wanted the Corinthians to have that same kind of attitude, and we ought to have that same kind of attitude tonight. Well, I'm not here to build some kind of kingdom for me. All right? I'm not. And I, and, and, and I don't think I'm doing it right to begin with, but I'm certainly not the only one doing it right. 
There are other people that love Jesus and are serving Jesus and are doing a great job and praise God for it. This is not a competition. I don't want to have that mindset. I don't want you to have that mindset. And so Paul talks to them about their attitude. Look in verse 5 through 9. He talks to them about their attitude towards him, towards Paul. Look in verse 9. I'm five, I'm sorry. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. So Paul writes in verse number five about his own plan to come to Corinth. He plans to come to Corinth when he passes through Macedonia. Verse number six. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. So you can tell Paul has a desire to go to Corinth and to stay a little while. You can, you, can, you can sense that in his tone. And he says, maybe I'll get to stay through the winter with you. That, he says, ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. Wherever it is, Paul says, uh, uh, I, I need your support. I want you to bring me on my journey. It, that, that implies them helping Paul get from one place to another place. That's missionary support. We didn't, we didn't make this whole thing up. This is not an independent Baptist thing we just thought up one day we're going to support missionaries. This is Bible. We get our philosophy of missions directly out of the Bible. And so, so Paul says, hey, I'm coming to Corinth. I'd like to stay a while. I'd like to roll up my sleeves and work a while. And, and, and uh, I'd like for you to support me on my mission. And 2,000 years later, we have people come through our church and they tell us about their burden. They tell us about what God's called them to do or we send them out of our church and they say, would you prayerfully consider supporting me, helping me along my journey, get from one place to the next place so I can take the gospel. And that is what we do. That's New Testament missions. Verse number seven. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit, Paul says, I don't want to just drop in. I'd like to stay a while. I'd like to stay some time if the Lord permits. Paul knew the Corinthian church really needed him. I mean, he's wrote, an, he's wrote this letter and he's, he's, he's wrote a lot of things to correct them. But Paul knows it would be worth his time and it would be helpful to them if he could go to Corinth and stay a little while and help them and preach to them, and teach them the word of God. But here's what he says in verse number 8. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Paul says, I'd really like to come to Corinth, like to stay a little while if God would permit, but i got to stay in Ephesus till Pentecost, because God is up to something here. There's a door that's open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Somebody said, I don't know who said it, but the door of, uh, the, the door of opportunity swings on the uh, hinges of opposition. Y'all ever heard that? The door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. Anytime there's an opportunity to do something for God, you can bet there's going to be opposition. And so Paul's dealing with it here. That's another message for another day. But he's not finished in Ephesus, and his plan is to remain there and take advantage of the opportunity God has given him. And then he plans to come to Corinth after that. And his desire is that they would be supportive of him, to have an attitude that is supportive to the Apostle Paul. And we ought to have an attitude that is supportive to other people that are doing the work of God. Amen? So, number one, to be supportive. And then he, he talks to, to them about their attitude towards Timothy, and he encourages them to be respectful. So to Paul, supportive, but to Timothy, respectful. Look in verse number 10. Now, if Timothy has come... See that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as also I do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. Now, Timothy was one of Paul's uh, preacher boys, wasn't he? In fact, he's probably making a case that he was Paul's favorite preacher boy. He was Paul's pick. Paul picked Timothy. Acts 16, Lystra, Iconium, he hears about Timothy's report. He's a faithful young man, and he picks up Timothy, and he becomes one of his most trusted assistants. And Paul says to the Corinthians, if, if Timothy comes to you, see that he's with you without fear. 
You study the life of Timothy, there's quite a bit said about Timothy, and you study his life out, read the, the epistles of 1st and 2nd Timothy, read what the book of Acts has to say, other epistles have to say, little tidbits here and there. It's like putting a puzzle together. You kind of figure out the kind of character and personality Timothy had. First of all, he's a younger man. And, and, uh, and so Timothy was probably a little bit intimidated, uh, maybe by the Apostle Paul, but certainly intimidated by some of the ministries that Paul had placed him in. But then you kind of get the idea that Timothy is uh, maybe a timid kind of person, that he's not as bold and not as brash as the Apostle Paul. And so we read the epistles there, First and Second Timothy, the letters there, the pastoral epistles, and Paul is constantly encouraging Timothy to face up to all the different situations that he's got going on. And so you kind of get an idea uh, of, of what is going on here with Timothy. He uh, is coming to Corinth, Lord willing, and Paul knows a little bit about the Corinthians. He knows about their, their love of intellectualism. He knows their, their, uh, their love of Apollos and their love of Peter and of himself. He knows how they hold uh, them in high regard. And you just kind of sense that Paul knows that the Corinthians are going to intimidate Timothy. And so he says to them, before he ever gets there, see that he doesn't come to you in fear. Don't intimidate him. Put him at ease when he comes. Don't despise him. Paul said to Timothy in one place, let no man despise thy youth. And Paul says to the Corinthians, don't despise him. He's a young man, but he's doing a great work. In fact, Paul says he's doing the same exact thing that I'm doing. He's doing this. So, so don't, don't uh, despise him. Don't reject him. Respect him. Respect him. Uh, what should our attitude tonight be towards younger people like Timothy that are in the ministry? We ever gave a whole lot of thought to that? What should, I, what should our attitude be like? Well, I can tell you what it shouldn't be like. We shouldn't despise them. We shouldn't despise them just because they don't have gray hair. True. Now, I understand there's something... There is something to be said about an older man that has been faithful to the Lord year after year after year. I mean, Brother Glenn's in his 80s, and, and, and he's been faithful to the Lord. And, I mean, he's, 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 Brother Glenn, you're twice my age, brother. Still going strong, still preaching the Word of God, still, 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 still being faithful to the Lord. He's a student of the Word of God. And there's a measure of respect that we should have for him that we don't have for other younger people. That's fair enough, isn't it? I mean, he has given himself year after year to the word of God and to the ministry. However, we also need to have a measure of respect for other younger men have, who have given themselves completely over to the word of God and to the ministry and to serve God. Right? And I understand some of these little teenage preacher boys it's hard to respect them sometimes because their character sometimes isn't all that good and I'm not saying that because any of them are, 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 are that way but I'm just saying that's just sometimes how it is and you're thinking you little young punk you're preaching at me and you're doing x y and z you know and it's kind of hard but you take a man you take a young man like like Kagan for example a 30 year old he's a young man I'm turning 40 tomorrow so he's a really young man isn't he and you know what? We ought to respect, we ought to have a respect for him. We shouldn't despise him because he's, he's younger than, than uh, a lot of other men of God and preachers. We ought to have a respect for him uh, because he has given himself over to the Lord. Now, I'm somewhere in the middle, right? I don't know that I can qualify as a younger man anymore. I still kind of try to hold on to that, but I think that ship is on its way out. It's kind of sailing, so I'm kind of embracing this middle age thing. Uh, I'm not an older preacher either, uh, but I'm not a younger one. Now, I started pastoring when I was in my, le my late 20s, which I thought was really old at the time uh, to, to start. I thought, man, this is kind of late to get started, but really, uh, it really wasn't all that late. I was... I was really just kind of a kid. I didn't know a whole lot. 
Uh, and, and be honest with you, I think I knew, I, I knew more then than I know now. I told, I told my wife the other day, I said, man, when I, was, when I first started, I, I, I knew so much. And now, at this juncture, I feel like I know so little. But I didn't know much, and be truthful with you, I was kind of intimidated. Most of the people I pastored were older than me, a lot older than me. I mean, most of them three times my age. And it, it was a little bit intimidating. Uh, and and I, I know I probably said some crazy things and some things that I, I wish I could get back. Uh, and some people respected me and some people uh, despised me. I mean, that's just the reality. Some people did and some people didn't. But the point is, uh, we, we should have an attitude of respect towards others in the ministry who are serving God no matter their age. And so if a young guy gets up and preaches and he says something a little bit off, let's give him grace, right? And let's, we'll correct it. We'll get it fixed, okay? Uh, but let's, let's do our best not to despise the younger men. Paul says the attitude towards Timothy ought to be respectful, so we should be respectful. And then towards Apollos, verse number 12, I know this is just like all over the place, but I'm just following what Paul's saying, okay? So he's all over the place. That's why I'm all over the place. Verse number 12 as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have a convenient time. Here's what Paul says. I wanted Apollos to come to Corinth. I thought that's what he needs to do. I thought that's the will of God for Apollos' life, but, Paul wouldn't, but Apollos wasn't convinced of that. Apollos didn't think that was uh, God's will for his life at that time. And so Paul says, I respected his decision. I respected his convictions. Now, how many are like me? We're really good at finding the will of God for everybody else. We're really good at knowing exactly what everybody else needs to do and exactly where everybody else needs to go. There was a very large church recently without a pastor, and I knew exactly who they needed. I, mean, I knew. I just knew. I mean, all they needed to do was call me and ask me because I knew, who, I knew who they needed to call. Problem is, nobody knows me from there, and they wouldn't have cared what I had to say, and, and I have no clue what they really needed, but in my mind, I knew who they needed, and when they didn't call that man, I thought, why didn't you call that person? That's who you needed. But... Maybe we ought to just let God do what God does, right? That's right? Let God be God and let him direct people in his will for their life. And Paul says we need to be understanding. Yeah. Apollos, Timothy, you need to be respectful. Uh, Paul says to me, supportive. Apollos, be understanding. He is following what he believes God is directing him to do. Letter D, the house of Stephanus, verse number 15. Look with me. I beseech you, brethren. I'm going to come back to 13 and 14. Don't worry. I'm not going to skip it. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth with us. So Stephanus and his family were some of the first people saved in Corinth. And Paul says of them that they were addicted to the ministry. They had an addiction, and it was the ministry. The word addiction there, it means devoted. But the King James translators use the word addicted, and I'm fine with that. It's the only time they ever used the word in the entire Bible. And they used it here. They were addicted to the gospel ministry. They had to have it. They, they couldn't go a day without it. They, they, uh, they, they needed it. They longed after it. Well, to God, we had some people that were addicted to the ministry that just had to have it. You know, hey, my name is, my name is Brother Ben, and I have an addiction. I'm addicted to gospel ministry. That ought to be the way that it is, that we are devoted, that we are addicted to the gospel. We wouldn't have to beg people to come to church if we were addicted to the ministry. We wouldn't have to beg people to give out gospel tracts if we were addicted to the ministry. We wouldn't have to beg people to give if they, if they, if they were addicted to the ministry. They'd have a, a case of, the, I can't help it. I've got to do it. Yes. Yes. Paul says about those people, verse number 16, 
Here's what it says about those that were addicted to the ministry, that you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. All those people that are leading, that are helping us, Paul says to the Corinthian church, submit yourselves unto such. Stephanus is going to go on to mention a couple other names. He says, submit yourself to those people. Verse number 17, I'll come back to that thought in just a minute. Verse number 17, I'm glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Acknowledge ye them that are such. Names those three men. They came from Corinth. They visited the Apostle Paul. They were a blessing to the Apostle Paul. He says, they made up for your lack of support to me. They were a blessing to me. And here's what he says about them. Acknowledge them. Respect them. Honor them. And so Paul says, submit yourself to these, to these leaders, honor them, respect them. You know what the kind of people we should have respect for and that we should, uh, that we should submit to? It's the kind of people that are devoted to the ministry. People that are addicted to the ministry. Why? Because they've proven themselves that they are a blessing. They've, they've, they've proven themselves that they are devoted wholeheartedly to the ministry. And Paul says, respect them, honor them, submit to them. That's the kind of leader that you should submit yourself to. Some people hear the word submit, and they immediately start getting all nervous. And I don't follow a man. I don't follow a man. I, you know, I, I, I've never, this is just me speaking for me, and I'm not the only one that, is in leadership. I've never tried, I don't think I've ever accomplished it, to be a dictator. Yes, yes. Never tried to do that. And if you've been around me for any length of time, you know that's true. There's a few people that probably have said that along the way. And that's probably just because I didn't agree with what they wanted me to agree with. And because I didn't agree with it, then that's what you get labeled. Yeah, that's right. And then they go leave and tell everybody that that's what you are. But that kind of can't be what you are because they left, you know, and they did what you told them not to do. But I've never tried to be that. Uh, I don't want to be that. That's not the kind of leader that I've ever aspired to be. But there is an aspect of, of, of submission. There is an aspect. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, not just, not just in, in my position, but to other people. We should be willing to yield ourselves and submit ourselves so that people can help us. And, and, and so here, here's Paul. He wants the Corinthians to have the right attitude towards other people. Mind you, he's not talking about himself, when he's talk, himself here when he's talking about submission. He's talking about other people. Because that's the kind of leader Paul was. He wanted the Corinthians to have the right attitude about other people in leadership and other people in the ministry. And I want that for you too. There are other people that can preach and can lead and can minister and do all those things far better than I can. Far better. I don't claim to be the best at anything. But I, I want you to know, it's not a competition. That's right. yeah. I don't see it as a competition. When I talk to my peers and they tell me about things going on that are great, I applaud that. I cheer for them, praise God for that. And if they ever get into some kind of competition type stuff, I'm out of it. I'm, I'm backing out. I don't want to talk about that. If that's the way you want to talk about ministry, I don't want to talk about it with you. Because it, this is not me versus you. This is not me. We're not, this is not my team and that's your team. That's not the way it works. If we're all trying to reach people with the gospel, we're all on the same team. And obviously you understand I'm not talking about all, as in anybody that believes anything. But you know what I'm saying. Y'all know me enough already to know what I mean by that. But I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not. There's some preachers when, when somebody comes in to preach, as soon as they get out the door, they're going to criticize them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're afraid that you might have respect for them, too much respect for them, and, and, and lose respect for you. I don't want that to be the case. Right. Somebody comes to preach here, I want to applaud them on the way out the door and say, good job. They did great, didn't they? Amen. Give them a pat on the back. That's not the kind of foolishness I want to be a part of, and I don't want you to be a part of that either, to have that attitude. 
I'm the pastor here. I appreciate all the respect you show me, but I know I am not the only one in this world doing anything for Jesus. I do not have something figured out that other people don't have figured out. I don't. I do not have a monopoly on anything. All right? And so let's have a good attitude towards all those who are serving God and doing the right thing. If God's using them and they're standing for truth, let's have the utmost respect for them. Let's support them and let's do all we can to encourage them along the way. That's the kind of attitude Paul wanted those in Corinth to have. I got to finish. Lastly, Paul instructs them concerning their standing firm. Verse number 13. Verse number 13. I'm going back. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Watch this. Let all your things be done with charity. Amen. Two verses are paired together for a reason. Right. Watch ye. Be on guard. Watch out. Yeah. There's always somebody trying to tear things up. That's right. Yes, sir. There's always somebody trying to tear something up. There's a, uh, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it because they would say it. There's a guy who came in a while back and didn't take me long to figure out what he believed. He didn't believe what we believed. And, uh, Second time he came in, I followed him around. I stayed right on top of him. And I think he got uncomfortable and figured out, like, I'm not going to be able to walk around here and peddle my lies. Because he's not going to be able to walk around here and peddle his lies. It's not going to happen. Watch ye. Watch ye. Always something, always somebody trying to tear things up. So we got to be on guard. Stand fast in the faith, Paul says. False teachers abound. You're going to have to stand fast on the faith. There's going to be doctrinal issues. Paul says you're going to have to stand on. Things we, got to, we can't back up on, right? We cannot back up on the Bible. We cannot back up on the gospel. We cannot back up on what we believe about the second coming of Christ. There's some things we can't back, some fundamentals we cannot back up on. We've got to stand fast in the faith. And if you don't like the doctrine that we believe, then... I know i got to get to that part about charity. I'll get there in a minute. But let me just, I'm just going to be mean for a minute. If you don't like it, we live in the Bible belt. We might as well call it the Bible buffet. There's somewhere for you. But it ain't here. I know, I know that sounds mean. But if you don't agree with the fundamentals that we, and I'm not saying somebody comes in, we can't, you know, you're going to grow and you're going to, I'm not talking about that, but if you come in and you have a totally different idea about what the Word of God says from what we believe and teach, it's not going to work, is it? It's just not going to work. And so, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. That means to be courageous. It means to man your post. Be strong, Paul says. Strengthen yourself spiritually. How do you strengthen yourself spiritually, Brother Ben? I meant to say physically. How do you strengthen yourself physically? <laughs> Exercise. How do you strengthen yourself physically, uh, spiritually? I'll get it right in a minute. The Bible. Right. Exercise. So we got to exercise ourselves. So strength. We got to know the Word of God, don't we? We got to study. We got to read the Word of God. Strengthen ourselves spiritually. Let me ask you this: What's going on in the Church of Corinth? What's going on? It's a mess, isn't it? It's a mess. For fifteen chapters, fifteen chapters, Paul is going through all of this instruction to deal with the mess. All right. So now we get to the end of it. And here's what Paul says. Okay, I've wrote you the instructions. I've given you a letter. Now somebody has got to do something about it. That's what he's saying. Somebody's got to get, somebody has to stand fast in the faith. Somebody has to quit you like men. Somebody has to be strong. Okay, I've given you all of the instructions to fix it, but somebody's going to have to fix it. Now, who wants to do that? I mean, who, if you're in Corinth and you get this letter and read it, you think, man, we got a lot of work to do. It's not going to be easy, is it? No, sir. It's not going to be fun. No, sir. And ministry is not fun sometimes. It's not for the faint of heart sometimes. It takes all of these things Paul mentioned to deal with these different things. I don't, I didn't, that's not what I love, okay? Uh, I don't really like to have to deal with that kind of thing. I don't really want to do that. And so I try to preach preventatively so I don't have to get into a bunch of that. And if you preach the Bible, then long term you do actually prevent a lot of that kind of thing. But sometimes you just have to. Because you can't allow things to go on. Especially doctrinally. That should not be going on. And it has to be dealt with. It has to be stopped. And so often I just scratch my head and go, 
why can't people just do what they ought to do? Just be where they should be and do what they should do and say what they should say, and it would save me a whole lot of heartache. But anyhow, that's, that's it. Be strong. And then watch this. Paul says this. Here's the, these two go together. Let all your things be done with charity. So be strong. Stand fast. Quit you like men. Take a strong hand. Paul says, but it's got to be done with love. It's got to be done with charity. With charity. All right, let's go to verse 19. We're just going to read these last few verses. We're done. Churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Paul is given a salutation from the churches in Asia, from Aquila and Priscilla. Not going to talk about them. All the brethren greet you. Here's a good one. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. Got quiet there, didn't it? I have been to foreign countries where they greet one another with a holy kiss. That's kind of awkward when a man comes up and gives you a, it's not really a kiss, but puts his face against yours. And I'm like, dude, I'm an American. Like, we don't do that here. We, we handshake and we do it like at a distance. Like, I don't like, I don't like the kiss. But it's a cultural thing, right? It's a cultural thing. And you kind of got to get over it when you go to a foreign country. You're either going to do it or you're just going to be rude. And so I got over it. But we're not kissing one another. We don't want to start that. We don't, we, 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 don't need, we don't need holy kisses and we don't need holy hugs. We don't need a church hugger, okay? Let's, let's, let's just keep all that. Will it, that be done somewhere else in another country? However, I think it's a good time to say this. I think it's a good time to say this. I, I do think that, uh, that we should be friendly. I do think we, we, ought to, uh, we ought to be a welcoming, hospitable group of people, don't you? We were talking to some people the other day, and they were talking about visiting churches, and, 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 and they were just talking about the fact that people don't do that anymore. Go to churches, they don't greet you, and they don't welcome you, and they're not friendly. And they weren't talking about our church, and I'm not saying that about our church. I think we're a friendly church, but we want to, we want to continue being that, don't we? And even more so. When somebody walks in, they ought to go back out and say, preaching might have stunk, but that was the most friendly group of people that we've ever met in our lives. Amen? Amen. That ought to be your goal this Sunday morning, to say, I'm going to be the most friendly person to a guest when they walk in. I'm going to, find, I'm going to hunt them down, and I'm going to be over-the-top friendly to them and uh, greet them. All right, verse number, verse number uh, 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha means to be cursed. The Lord is coming soon. Paul's saying, if you don't love Jesus, if you don't love Jesus, you better get saved because you're cursed and Jesus is coming again very soon. All right? Verse number 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I miss verse 21. Paul lets us know he's writing this portion. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. We covered a lot of ground, didn't we? Paul says... 15 chapters, 15 chapters, Paul very bluntly, sometimes it seems even harshly, blows out the Corinthian church. You need to get this right, you need to get this right, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and it's wrong. And he gets to the end, he says, just want you to know, I love you. Just want you to know that I love you. And he did, didn't he? Yes, sir. Correction, reproof. It's necessary, but it needs to be done with a spirit of love. May God help us to do that. I'd like to get back and do an overview. If the Lord wills, that's what we'll do next Sunday night, next Wednesday night. We'll go back, overview the whole book. I hope God has helped you as we went through this study together. This is my first trip through 1 Corinthians, preaching through it. God has helped me so many ways, encouraged me as we went through it. I think you're going to be encouraged as we go into 2 Corinthians too. And so there's your heads up, there's your homework. You can go home and start reading through 2 Corinthians and letting the Lord begin to work in your heart. Saturate yourself with his word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for teaching us by your Holy Spirit. Pray that you would bless uh, the week ahead of us, the remainder of the week that we've got left and the Lord's day that we've got coming. Pray that you would bless all of it, bless our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me mention just a couple things to you real quick. We'll... We'll go home, and the young people should be getting out. See, I preached all the way up till time for them to get out. That was my goal. All right, uh, Christmas.
program practice will be Saturday at 3 o'clock. I believe I'm right about that. And uh, then 5 p.m. it says fellowship to follow practice. This Friday, Family Fun Night, been making mention of that. 5.30 at Skyline Gym, been trying to encourage you with that. Some have asked about things to auction. If you are interested in that, I've got a number here. Uh, Adam Thomas, you can call him. He will give you information about what they're looking for and what they need. And so I'll have that with me in the back. If, you're, if you uh, have any questions about that, you can call him. Uh, pray for our youth night coming up on Sunday evening. We're willing outreach on November the 9th. That'll be not this Saturday, but next Saturday, do some outreach. All right, let's stand together. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's dismiss in a word of prayer. Brother Wesley, it's good to see you tonight. Would you pray for us as we dismiss?